Welcome co-founder of the COVID Tracking Project at The Atlantic and Atlantic staff writer, Alexis Madrigal. Hello, everyone. I am pleased to introduce Dr. Anthony Fauci, director of the National Institute of Allergy and Infectious Diseases. Dr. Fauci, welcome to the Atlantic Festival. Thank you. Um, Thank you. Good to be with you. Now that there are more than 200,000 Americans who have died from coronavirus, I want to take you back to the last week in March. Um, that was when you said that your middle of the road estimate um, was that it was likely that 100,000 to 200,000 Americans would die. Um, from COVID-19. How do you evaluate the U.S. response, given that we're beginning to move past the higher end of your early predictions? Well, I mean, obviously, the numbers speak for themselves. I mean, there have been there have been some situations where things have worked well, and in some situations where they've not. One of the things that has always troubled me, you know, we got hit very badly, particularly in the early part when the northeastern part of the country namely the New York metropolitan area, was accounting for, you know, m almost half of all the infections, hospitalizations, and deaths. And then when they turned around and came back down, they came down to a baseline that is low and stayed low, which is good. They've suffered terribly, uh, but right now they're in, a, they're in a good place. The situation that we then went into is one that is troublesome. And that is as we started to try and open the economy again, which I think we needed to do because you couldn't stay shut down indefinitely because of the effect not only on the economy, but on the economy, but other health issues. But what happened as we tried to open the country again, the states in their response to that were very variable. Some did not adhere strictly to the guidelines which we put forth, you know, the starting off where you have a certain checkpoint in the beginning, and then you go to phase one, phase two, and phase three. Some try to, but the people in the states and in the cities really didn't pay attention and essentially went around without masks and congregated at bars. And you saw the baseline, which was at about 20,000 cases per day, which is unacceptably high. It went up gradually 30, 40, 50, and actually went up at one point to over 70,000 cases a day. Then as things started to turn around, where people realized that they really needed to do some of the things that we've been saying in a measured way, it came down to around 30 to 40. But right now it's still stuck at between 35 and 40,000 a day. That's not good. No matter how you slice it, that's not good. Now there are parts of the country yeah. that are doing very well. When you look at the map of the country, we're a big country, we're heterogeneous geographically, demographically, and otherwise. But the other things we've done differently is the difference in how we've responded. And there are parts of the country that are doing well. We should make them be the models. But there are others, you're starting to see an uptick in test positivity. And we know from historical observation retrospectively that when that happens, you're gonna have a surge. So as I've said so many times, Alexis, that the fact is, that if you do the simple public health measures, universal wearing of masks, physical distancing, avoiding crowds, doing things outdoor more than indoors if possible, and washing your hands, that sounds like it's very simplistic. But we know when we do that consistently, we prevent surges and we turn them around. So the concern I have okay. now, I'm giving more of an answer than you wanted, is that we're entering into the fall and into the winter. And that means there's going to be more indoor things than outdoor things. And going into that situation, I would like to have seen the baseline of where we are, the daily number of infections come way, way down and not be stuck at around 30 to 40,000 per day, which is where it is right now. So it seems like looking out into the winter, there's really two very different stories you could tell right now. One is that, you know, the baseline is too high. We're heading into the winter, which people have been worried about, the uh, onset of flu season. The other is, well, you know, we have a lot more testing, possibly vaccines, which we're going to talk about later. There is a sort of hopeful story that you could tell about the, the winter as well. So where are we, do you think? Is this sort of the beginning of the end or is it really the beginning of, of a new wave? Well, again, we, we, we continue to talk about the new wave. And I keep telling people, you know, that's based on the model 
of the 1918 pandemic, which had cases in the spring of 1918. And then things essentially disappeared in the summer. And then when the fall came, we did have a second wave in 1918, because you went from essentially nothing to an enormous wave that was far worse than the original outbreak, which occurred in the spring of 1918. That's not comparable right now. We've got to get out of the situation we're in right now, which means you don't talk about first wave, second wave. We're looking at 40,000 new cases per day. That's unacceptable. And that's what we've got to get down before we go into the more problematic winter. But to the point that you made about vaccines, that is critical. And that's a good news story thus far. And I'm cautiously optimistic about that because we have three vaccine candidates in phase three trial already. A fourth one will very shortly go into phase three trial. And they're involving a large number of individuals, anywhere from 30,000, some trials are 44,000, another one is 60,000. So we hope that by the time we get into the late fall and early winter, November and December, we will know whether a vaccine is safe and effective. There's never a guarantee, Alexis, that you're going to get a safe and effective vaccine. But I'm cautiously optimistic, looking at the initial data from some of the phase one trials, that in fact, we will be successful. How successful we'll be, the only way you know is look at the results of the clinical trial. The other good news is that even as we're doing the testing, We've made a major investment in hundreds of millions of dollars the federal government has to make doses of the vaccine so that they are ready when the decision is made whether a vaccine is safe and effective. So you don't have to wait months. So if we get an answer, let's say November, December, it's possible it could be earlier. I think it's going to be likely November, December, we can then start vaccinating people, starting with the healthcare workers, starting with the vulnerables. Vulnerables, I mean yeah. the elderly and those with underlying conditions. So that's a good so news I've, potential. Yeah. Yeah. I've listened to dozens of interviews, interviews with you over the last six months, and you've definitely become pro progressively more optimistic about the vaccine timeline. And it really does seem like the vaccine development and production program, Operation Warp Speed, um, is a bright spot in the American response. How much do you think that that program specifically has sped up vaccine development and eventually distribution? Okay, so l let me backtrack for a second, Alexis, and correct you on something. I haven't become sure. progressively more optimistic. In January of this year, when I was asked, when do I think we might have a vaccine that we could start? And go back to my quotes. Some of them you've heard me. I said about a year with them now. So a year from January 2020, not 2019, is December. So I haven't changed <laughs> anything. Okay. So let's keep that for the record. The other thing is that this, this issue of Operation uh, Warp Speed um, I think we we need to clarify, and I'd appreciate the opportunity to do this, that the sound sure. of that, I never like warp speed. It kind of makes it look like you're rushing things recklessly. It's not. What it is, is that we've done things in a very fast pace based fundamentally on two things, on a utilization and taking advantage of scientific advances and technological advances in what we call vaccine platform technology, where you can go from the sequence of a virus, which we knew on January 10th, to going into a phase one trial within a couple of months, which has never been done. And there's not sacrificing safety nor scientific integrity. And then seven months later, we're in a phase three trial. And the fact that we are in a phase three trial now is not a testimony to cutting corners but utilizing the technological advances that we have. So that's the reason why I sound optimistic, because the things that I said in January, which would be dependent on getting us a year later to have vaccines, fortunately for us, have worked out. The phase one trials looked good. They've induced the response in individuals that would be comparable to what you would get from natural infection. 
namely it induced a response you would predict would be protective. That's always a good prognostic sign for whether the vaccine is going to work or not. It's not going to tell you how effective it is, but it's strongly hinting that it will be effective. That's the reason why I might sound more up about it, because the results that we have actually do look good. Sure. Um, I want to ask you this uh, directly, just so you have a chance to answer it. I mean, I know many times you've said that the you know approval and distribution of vaccines will be guided by science. But do you think that the announcement of a vaccine will come on the administration's political timeline? No, no. And, and, and I could tell you why that's the case, Alexis, um, is that the data will determine the announcement. So each of these trials has a data and safety monitoring board, which is a group of people who are qualified scientists, who are qualified uh, 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 ethicists, who are qualified statisticians, who will look at the data at intermittent times and determine one of four things. A, they'll look and they'll say, you know, you don't have enough data to say it's working or it's not working, continue the study. Or it'll look and say, you know, the way that's distributed, you're never going to get an answer. So you might as well Yes, it's a futile study. Or they may say, wait a minute, we're seeing more infections in the vaccine group than the placebo group. So we better stop this because it's a dangerous trial or what we're hoping and what usually happens with a successful vaccine. They'll say we're starting to see that the data is showing that the vaccine is working. The only person who sees that data is the unblinded statistician on the data safety monitoring board, who's beholden to no one, not to the FDA, not to the president, not to me, and not to the company. When they look at the data, and if it looks good, then they tell the company, then the company makes the decision, shall I go to the FDA and apply either for an emergency use authorization or actually for licensure, which we call a BLA, a biological license application. The FDA then examines that and looks at it with an advisory board. Those data become public and transparent so that scientists like myself, my colleagues, people like Dr. Collins, the director of NIH, will be able to see that data. So any decision about whether or not you're going to approve a vaccine is going to be very transparent. It, it, I mean, if, if someone tries to make an end run, that's going to be clearly obvious. Got it. You know, and there, the reason I ask these things is, you know, there have been a series of kind of confusing, concerning stories on changing CDC guidance, on HHS messaging, even sort of direct political editing of CDC's morbidity and mortality weekly report. And I think the question that's on a lot of people's minds, people trust you. You're the most trusted person on coronavirus. But where else should Americans go for for information they can trust? You know, I think fundamentally, uh, it's been unfortunate what happened with the try and manipulate of the CDC. There was an individual in the department who, as no, is past history. That person is no longer there. The person who was trying to influence the CDC and even me with emails is gone. I never listened to the person. Just don't bother me. Get out of here. I mean, that's the way it was. So I think we could put that behind us right now. So I would trust the CDC and I would trust the FDA. The FDA commissioner has made it very clear that he is going to make sure that the in the trenches scientists who look at these types of things all the time, that's what they do for a living. They're going to be the ones that are going to be making the recommendation. You know, when HIV AIDS sort of first emerged, there was obviously a lot of fear mongering and misinformation. So these things are obviously not new. But this time around, there's kind of an entire ecosystem, mostly on the far right, that's really downplayed the pandemic, tried to cast doubt on, you know, the number of people being infected and dying. What effect do you think that those forces have had on the course of the pandemic in this country? Uh, It's been detrimental, Alexis, because what the what the general public needs is a message that's consistent and that they can believe. And what's happened, unfortunately, 
and and I think this you have to be asleep not to realize this that we are living in a very divisive society right now. There's no doubt about that. That's not my opinion. That's just obvious of what we see. It's politically charged also. And what's happened is that public health issues and public health recommendations have taken on a we versus them approach, getting back to the point where getting people to wear masks. It was like a a statement not to wear Mm -hmm. a mask. People don't, people, as you know, it's public knowledge now, have been threatening me as a public health person, literally threatening me and my family because I'm saying we should be doing public health things like wearing a mask, physical distancing, as if I'm doing something that is harmful to them. They interpret it as the public health measure is hurting them. No, the virus is hurting us, not the public health measures. The public health measures really should be looked upon as a vehicle or a pathway to reopen the economy and to get the country back and to get employment back. It shouldn't be looked upon as an obstacle. So what I'm talking about is not shutting down. Put shutting down away. We know what the detrimental aspect of that is on a lot of people. I'm talking about trying to open the economy, but doing it in a measured, careful way, according to the guidelines that we carefully put forth. If we did that, Alexis, I'm almost certain we would not have seen those surges of cases that brought us up to 70,000 a day and have now plateaued down at 30 to 4,000 a day. I believe if we do that, We're going to see things turning around. And I know because if you look at that big map of our beautiful country, there are certain areas of the country that are doing really well. We need to make those be the models. Great. Thank you, Dr. Fauci. We're going to have to leave it there. Thank you so much for joining us today and for all of your service to the country. Thank you, Alexis, for having me. I appreciate it.